to the Bangalore Theory Seminar Series. Um, this week, we are excited to have Professor Harold Rake as our guest speaker. Professor Rake is a professor at the School of Computing, Information and Technology in Technical University of Munich. His research interests lie in the design of algorithms and particularly developing approximation and online algorithms for problems in area of graph partitioning, scheduling routing in parallel systems and in metric embeddings. Today, he will be giving a talk titled uh, Hop Constraint Expander Decompositions Oblivious Routing and Distributed Universal Optimality. So with that, let's welcome Professor Eke and uh, all yours, Professor. Okay, can ev uh, everything's clear so you can hear me well or? Okay, then, uh, okay, first, thank you for the introduction and reminding me that this is wrong. So the thing is, uh, I'm not at the Faculty for Informatics anymore because we changed to a school now containing also electrical engineering. So uh, in beginning of the uh, of this year, we changed to a school and I still sometimes accidentally use Faculty for Informatics on my slides. Sorry for that. Okay, so interrupt me uh, at any point if you have a question or so, because I cannot see simply um, say something. Okay, so <laughs> this is joint work with Bernard Teuble and Mosen Gaffari. So um, what is the problem? So first, let me remind you about or uh, define what is a congestion model of distributed computing. So what are we doing in distributed computing? We are given a graph. Uh, the graph is usually undirected. And Nodes in the graph know their ID, so every node has a unique ID containing log n bits or so. <laughs> and the initial setup is essentially knows node knows main maybe his ID. He knows maybe the IDs of his neighbor, but this also the node could uh, find out by a very uh, simple um, messaging. The whole thing consist of synchronous round and rounds and what can we do in each round? That's the important part. <laughs> we can send log n bits to any neighbor. So every node can so send log n bits to any neighbor. So if you have log n neighbors, you can send log n bits along every edge. And you can perform arbitrary computation. So because this is about communication uh, that you need to solve a problem, the computation that you are allowed to do here can not really ex be exploited because the really limiting factor is the number of bits that you can send along edges. So now in this congested model of distributed computing, we want to solve a very basic problem and the problem is packet routing. <laughs> so now we have this graph, every node has a packet and what does this packet contain? The packet contains essentially the ID of the target. So now the goal is to deliver all packets in as few rounds as possible. This is a setup. This is a packet routing problem. So you can view this as suppose that your, your network here is the internet and we deleted all routing information. We had a global blackout. All routing information is lost. The only thing that is uh, left is every node has a MAC address. And now I want to talk to Arindam and I want to, I have his, his MAC address and I want to send him a message. So how do I do this? Um, These I, packets arrive uh, in synchronous times, right? No, here I have this very basic setup. All packets are there in the start. It's a start. Everybody has a packet and now the thing starts. Okay. Okay, okay so now, um, Okay, we want to solve this in as few rounds as possible, so as close to optimum as possible, and essentially this is impossible. So let me give you an example. Suppose this is a setup. So only node C has packets, and node C has packets for these other vertices. So node C doesn't have any information. So the thing is now, what should the node do? Where should it try to send a packet. So this is, um, okay, this is of course not a proof, but this this 
is kind of very difficult. The node C needs to find the targets. And in this scenario, you can solve the problem. Node C could kind of start flooding the network and then could collect all the information about the network. But the problem is if kind of you have several nodes that kind of want to communicate and they don't know where the neighbors are. So one can make a formal argument that this is kind of, cannot really solve this. Um, so therefore we look at a slightly different setting. What we do is the following. <laughs> we, not only the source has a packet, but also every target knows that it is expecting a packet. So 35 knows that it is expecting a packet from C. And in this scenario, then 35 could kind of do something about this. Kind of maybe try to help the node C to find it. Okay, so this is a setup. We do kind of this bi-directional packet routing. So what is known about packet routing? Packet routing is very well uh, analyzed uh, in terms of uh, parallel computing. This is a slightly different setup. But what are important parameters here? <laughs> Suppose that you know for every packet which path it should choose in the network. So basically if for every packet you fixed a path, then there are two important parameters of this path system. The first one is a congestion, how many packets go through every edge, and the dilation, what is the length of the longest routing path. These are two important parameters, and then one can easily gets the lower bound of C plus D that are required for routing. Why is this? If I have a packet that needs to go D steps, where the uh, routing path has D edges, yeah, this will take D steps in total because we, you need D rounds in order to format this packet. If I have an edge that has, that kind of where C packets have to traverse this edge, then the, these edge traverses have to do, uh, have to be performed in C rounds. So I need time C. So I get a lower bound of C plus D if I fix the path system. And this is also an upper bound. So, 1988, uh, late McGraw have shown that you can also uh, send all the packets in C plus D steps. So then if you fixed already the path, you only have to, at each point in time, you have to uh, ask yourself, oh, I have several packets, which one should, uh, maybe I have several packets that want to compete for a link. Uh, then I have to decide which packet should go first. So they showed that you can do this in C plus D by, by an application of lower schlock lemma. Um, in the same paper, they also give, uh, gave a very simple scheduling algorithm that can do this in C plus D log n steps. And here, how does this scheduling algorithm work? Essentially, um, every packet initially, so if you know the congestion, then every packet chooses a random delay, an initial random delay, and the, you can choose a random delay in such a way that the expected number of packets that at any point in time compete for a link is just logarithmic, or the, sorry, the expectation is just, just constant. And then, um, uh, if the expectation is constant, then with high probability at most log n packets will compete for an edge. And then kind of you can uh, make a partition every time step into log n sub time steps. And then you get to this running time. So here this log n comes from the fact that you have to partition every time step into log n sub time steps. <laughs> and so basically, here, I don't really care about logarithmic factors. So therefore, um, this is good enough for me. So I get, get roughly C plus D. So the only question that is kind of left is, how do I find a path system where C plus D is close to optimal? 
and I want to find this pass system some, somehow fast. And here in particular, I don't really know the network, so I have to find this pass system in a distributed setting. So one way to choose pass is oblivious routing. Um, so in oblivious routing, so here, here the problem in general is maybe it could be the case that this path, it's very, a very difficult optimization problem to come up with a good path system. So then how should I do this quickly? So oblivious routing is a routing method where you don't really optimize the path system very well. So what you do is you essentially uh, fix a path a priori. So for every pair in the network, you choose a path or actually a probability distribution of a path. And then if you get a packet, you sample a path from this probability distribution. So what does this mean? The path that you choose for a packet doesn't only depend on the source and the target, of course, and maybe on some randomization. So, but you don't kind of see, oh, which other packets are around in the network. Maybe for optimization, I would say, oh, if this pair wants to send a packet, this node pair, then maybe I want to route this way. If this node pair is not active, then I route, route this way. There may be optimization uh, that you, uh, like this that you could do, but oblivious routing does not do this. But because oblivious routing is so simple, you can, this uh, implemented in a distributed scenario very well. So if every node knows its probability distribution, it can independently sample a routing path. Um, so the question is, is oblivious routing any good? So if you want to minimize dilation, that's very easy. Shortest path routing is oblivious. So there's an oblivious routing that uh, minimizes the dilation trivially. If you want to minimize congestion, you can also find a good oblivious routing scheme. Um, there are results where you can find at least oblivious routing schemes with a pull logarithmic competitive ratio. Here for congestion, you can show that you cannot get better than log n. Okay, so, okay. But now this is, this is not what we want to do. If we want to minimize the sum of congestion and dilation, and actually for sum of congestion and dilation, there is no good oblivious routing scheme. Why is that? So very easy example. Mm -hmm. You have a pass, kind of you have two vertices S and T, and now you have, oh, so, so you have kind of very, a bunch of long paths. So each one of these has, maybe square root of n vertices. And then in addition, S and T are connected by a single edge. So now if you only say, if you only want to have send one packet, then what you do is you send this packet along the single edge. If you, but if you want to send say square root of n packets, so here what you have, you have square root of n paths, and each path here will have a length of roughly square root of n. So if you want to send square root of n packets, or say you want to send uh, um, n packets. So if you want to send n packets, so if I send n packet and I choose, uh, send them along this single link, I had to get a congestion of n. And congestion plus dilation will be n. But I can do a lot better uh, by distributing them along the path. Yeah, you have a question? Uh, Professor, uh, quick question. Uh, yeah. Just want to understand whether, uh, sorry, if this is uh, already clear, but uh, just is congestion a property of the vertices or of the edges? Well, sorry, of the edges. Oh, I forgot. Of the edges. So, so the uh, of effectively of the path, right? Yeah. So uh, the congestion is um, uh, the number of paths that goes through any single edge. Uh, and and uh, just like congestion plus dilation is one function, you might want to choose any function of congestion and dilation. So f of c comma d. Um, yeah, so here I'm looking at congestion plus dilation. Right. right. I could mm -hmm. use other function of congestion plus dilation, other function of the path system, but this is a function that is important for our routing. 
okay thank you uh, so, uh, just want to understand yeah. if this function changes uh, does the uh, uh, do the properties change and the algorithm change or as long as it's linear or something might be fine um the thing is okay what is this this is um uh, c plus d this is the uh is the property of the path system that i choose what i uh, basically what i get is input i get is input the packets and then i have to choose a path system i see and okay. then if the path system if this is as if this is close to optimal, then my routing that I will be doing with this path system will be uh, will have very short time. Okay, thank you. Okay, so and here, uh, if I have n packets, so what happens if I have n packets? <laughs> I, if I all these n packets go along this link, then I have a congestion of n. C would be n. And the dilation would be one, but C plus D would be N. But instead, if I say I route square root of N packets along each of these paths, this routes then all my packets, so square root of N along every path, then I get a dilation of square root of N because every path has length square root of N. So, and I would get the congestion of square root of N because every edge only has square root of n uh, uh, packets going through it. So basically, I have two options. I, if I send the single link, I get this. If I distribute myself among the paths, I get this. Now, if I get n packets, I clearly want to do this because then C plus D will be two times square root of n. If I have one packet, so if I do the whole thing for one packet, Then I will get if I kind of send the packet along along again in one of these paths, I will get a, a congestion of one, but the dilation of square root of n. But if I se uh, send it along the single link, I will get a congestion of uh, one and the dilation of one. So this is a problem. An oblivious routing scheme cannot base its routing decision. It cannot differ between it cannot differentiate between these two scenarios. So therefore I cannot with an oblivious gouting scheme here hope to get a good result. Now there is another concept of oblivious routing introduced by Holpler and Graffery, <laughs> which is called H hop oblivious routing. And here the oblivious routing scheme um, gets one additional parameter this parameter h. And you can view h as kind of the optimal routing time also. So, or h is a hint to the routing algorithm what the length of the routing path should be. So, and now let's say the congestion, the c opt h is the optimum congestion that I can obtain if I choose routing paths that have at most H hops. So basically now this is a constricted routing. I on, I'm only allowed to use routing paths of H hops. And now a C competitive H hop oblivious routing scheme does the following. It uses routing paths of lengths at most, yeah, a little bit larger than this H. But it has close to optimal congestion. If I, if it compares itself to an optimal routing scheme that uses routing paths of at most h length h. And now, in some sense, if if I know h, if I choose the right h, then this will be good. So if if I'm choosing for h, kind of the length of the routing path that the real optimal algorithm would choose, then uh, this will be good routing. So in some sense, um, this routing algorithm is given kind of this parameter h, and then it can base its decision also on h, which kind of gives, gives a hint to the routing algorithm what is the length of the routing path that it cho should choose. Now, the thing is, 
in practice, it's, yeah, okay. Theory you practice, I don't know, but uh, you can actually very quickly get such a good estimate for H because what you simply do is you, <laughs> you try your routing. If your routing takes too much time, then you know that your guess for H was not good. Then what you do is you can undo everything that you did so far and you double your guess for H. So this is a standard uh, guessing and doubling technique. So uh, which you can use in order to uh, get a good approximation for H. And so we can assume that we know the right value for H. The, uh, the, uh, the routing path, the length of the routing path that an optimal algorithm would choose. And therefore this can also be implemented very efficiently also in a distributed environment. Okay. Um, and they show that there exists an edge probability routing scheme with a polyrhythmic competitive ratio. So unfortunately, this is only existence. So computing this routing scheme would take very long. So here we want to kind of compute the routing scheme quickly. And the thing is, what should we expect? How, should, how good can we be? <laughs> Actually, already in, ex in expander, this is pretty difficult. Um, in an expander, you can compute an, yeah, an order of one competitive path system in polynomial time. So you can approximate congestion plus dilation up to a constant. Um, but if you want to do this in a distributed setting, even uh, if you want to, um, allow you yourself a much larger factor. So you can, for example, not obtain a pull, a pull look competitive path system in a distributed setting efficiently. So therefore we should not hope for a pull look here because even on an expander, if I know that the graph is an expander, I cannot do it. And this H of this routing is not really important in expander because in, in expander, I will always only use routing paths of links order log n. Okay, so um, this is the thing that we should hope for and to the little of one. We will not be better. Um, okay, is this of course not a proof, but this is an important open question in distributed computing. Say on an expander, can I get a pull lock for this problem? Okay, so what we show is, yeah. Is there, is there any known lower bound for this problem? Um, for doing it in ex expander, yeah, a distributed setting expander is it known that you cannot do better than like smaller of log n or something? Well, okay, um, log n you will anyway need. Um, so the thing is, is uh, okay, so here you are uh, out of one competitive, um, but uh, here, of course, in a uh, I'm not so sure, I don't know of any lower bounds, um, but I only know people who, yeah, you usually don't care. Uh, you need the distance of log n in the expander anyway. Here, this is, this will be, this is kind of you solve linear, uh, linear program and do a careful grounding of linear program and then you can get a constant. But in an expander, in a centralized setting, you can actually pretty easily get log n competitive. Very easy, valiance trick. Route to random intermediate node from there, route to the target. So in a centralized setting, it's very easy to do an expander. But um, um, so at least with a lock in competitive thing, but I don't know of any lower bounds here, but uh, this is a little bit striking that it's totally trivial to get a lock n in a centralized setting, but in a distributed setting, um, it's very difficult to do because you cannot do this route to random intermediate node and from there to the target. This does not work in a centralized setting. In, in, a, in a distributed setting. Thanks. Okay, so what do we do? Um, we show that there exist routing tables that give you an n to the little of one competitive oblivious, H of oblivious routing scheme. 
and we show that we compute these actually in this time, where we have the diameter of, of G there and its poly, polynomial in H and, and the little of one lumps. So now, why is this interesting? So suppose that the diameter of your graph is not too large, so you don't have linear diameter also. So it's the diameter is n to the little of one. Then remember that H is kind of a guess on the optimal routing time. So then this means kind of if I can route it with n to the little of one, then our routing scheme will route it with n to the little of one. And this is, for example, important in distributed computing universal optimality because this packet routing lies at the heart of nearly all the problems there. And this then says for the setup here, if you can solve the problem in time and the little of one, then this actually solves it in the little of one. So, and this can then be applied to uh, um, a lot of problems in distributed computing. Um, okay, so then I will uh, kind of sketch a little bit the technique, so I won't go uh, completely into detail here. Um, okay, so there is another, uh, there's a paper that gave a different construction from the previous construction for oblivious routing. The paper is actually about something else, but this is only a side result in this paper. <laughs> and this gave uh, uh, oblivious routing with a competitive ratio of n to the little uh, so and a little of one, of course. Um, uh, worse than the previous oblivious routing algorithms that obtain polylog, but the construction was completely different. So here, what you do is you do the following. While G is not a phi expander, I explain in a moment exactly what I mean with this. You partition G into pieces so that each piece is a phi expander. And then you contract all the pieces into single vertices and you repeat. You compute a hierarchy by this. So this gives you a hierarchy. So you start with your graph. It's not usually not an expander. You partition it into little, uh, many little expanders. You contract every expander, you get a new graph, and yeah, then you repeat this whole thing. And then in the end, this, is, this will give you a hierarchy, uh, which we call the expander hierarchy. Okay, so what is an expander? Usually a phi expander is the following. <laughs> you have a graph and you say the graph is a phi expander. If for every cut, if you don't have small cuts in there, the capacity of a cut should be at least this parameter phi. So phi is something less than one um, times the, the volume of the smaller side. So maybe if, if this is a smaller side, you want that phi is at least the volume of the smaller side. The volume is the sum of vertex degrees. So essentially you count the number of all edges on the side. So this is a phi expander for the, and now actually here in this, they actually do it slightly different when they decompose this graph into expanders. They don't want to have phi expanders. They want to, something, uh, want to have something a little different. So what you do is you want to have alpha boundary linked phi expanders. So what is an alpha boundary linked phi expander? So here it's important. We partition the, the stuff into pieces. So they are actually, if I, uh, if I have this bigger graph partitioned into pieces, now I have a piece and there are edges that would leave this piece. Now these edges, they are also part of this, this volume computation here. So I want that the capacity of the cut <clears throat> is at least phi times the minimum of the volume of the smaller side, uh, phi times the volume of the smaller side. But now what, uh, uh, how do I compute the volume here? I have every edge here counts to this volume, but the edges that leave here, they count to this volume even more. 
every edge that leaves here kind of kind of counts for alpha edges. And what is the value of phi here? Phi is usually something like one over two to the squared log n, roughly like this. Phi is quite small. And now alpha depends on phi. Alpha times phi is something polylog. So actually, if phi is small, you actually put a lot of edges here. So now I explain why, why this is interesting. So here what you do is, how do you go out? So, okay, what is this expander hierarchy? Again, you take your graph, you decompose your graph into pieces. Each piece is a phi expander, this alpha boundary link phi expander. It's a phi expander even after replacing each edge by alpha self loops, by counting the alpha um, outgoing edges as alpha edges. And now you want to, you cut, roughly cut phi m edges in this process. So this is what you do is you cut this into pieces. The number of edges that go between pieces is rather small, only phi m. So now if you do this, you get a hierarchy. The height of this hierarchy is determined by this. It's kind of roughly uh, log to the base, um, uh, log to the base one over phi of n. And if phi is this previous value, the height will be roughly um, uh, um, square root of log n. So the height will not be logarithmic. It will be just square root of log n. That's important. This is by this choice of phi. So you get this hierarchy. How do I go out in this hierarchy? So now the routing in this hierarchy, I can view as being done top down. So suppose that this is the highest level of the hierarchy. So basically my whole construction stops if this here, if, if I consider these to be single vertices, now if this is an expander, suppose that this, if these are single vertices, this is an expander. So now how do I route between a vertex that is in here to vertex that is in here. This maybe, how do I choose a path? So first I go out on the highest level. So I choose a path that connects this cluster to this cluster, maybe this one. So I select this path. Now I kind of, so basically this is on the highest level where I contracted all of this into single vertices. This red thing will give me a path. Now, if I uncontract everything, I, this path is broken. I just have these edges. So what I have to do is, in order to get this path again, I have to fix this. Then I can get a path again between these endpoints. So now what, what happens, why can I choose, why can I fix this up? Or what happens here? So, so the thing is, I, I know that this, this thing here is an expander. This is a phi expander. Suppose that on the boundary edges, here on these edges connecting these, I have a congestion of C. So basically the previous levels of my routing got me a congestion of C. <laughs> now, what do I know? This is a phi expander. So in this phi expander, I can route everything with a congestion roughly one over phi. Up, I'm ignoring pull log factors. So basically I can route in this phi expander with a congestion of one over phi. So basically I can, I can fix this up with a con and the total congestion will be, now be one over phi times C. Basically I start with a congestion of C. Now I have a congestion of one over phi times C. And with every level, I get this one over five factor. This is a complete disaster. With every level in this hierarchy, I get a one over five factor. This kills me. If I then put in the, uh, uh, the height, this is too much. But now the important thing is here, we have this alpha boundary linked expanders. So 
every edge that kind of enters or leaves kind of is weighted in this expansion with a with so this is still a phi expander if I weight this edge with a factor alpha. So actually I could suppose that I have congestion of C, I could kind of take the traffic that enters this vertex, distribute it on the alpha self loops, which then would give me congestion of C divided by alpha. And then I route it in this expander to this target. And this then costs me this factor one over phi. So in total, what I would get is in, with every step in this hierarchy, my congestion increases by this factor. And now we said that this is um, okay. So this was wrong. This is one over polylog. <laughs> Alpha times phi is one over polylog. So now this whole thing here will only be polylog. And this is like this is something I can afford. With every level of the hierarchy, I lose a polylog factor. But the height of this hierarchy is uh, something like um, squared of log n. And therefore, I'm not losing too much. So this is the idea behind this expander hierarchy. So now, what do I do if I want to incorporate distances here? Because we don't want to have this. We want to incorporate distances in our routing. This is just for congestion. One question. What is the yeah. algorithm to have this decomposition? Like, how do you decompose graphs like this? Uh, how do I decompose graphs like this? Um, this is a, a now well-known technique, expander decompositions. OK. Um, uh, you can do this actually pretty quickly. You can do this in nearly linear time. And you can also do this, uh, maintain this expander hierarchies upon deletions and insertions. So this is a, this is a recent trend, uh, in particular in dynamic algorithms, this expander hierarchies are very, or this expander decompositions, decomposing a graph into many little expanders. This is a very useful technique. I have seen in Danupon paper, one of his paper, he used this system. Danupon Nanunkari, he has used yeah. this. Yeah, they use it a lot. Nowadays, they use it for nearly every problem that they attack. So this is a very, uh, very important technique in distributed algorithms. OK, um, now what I want to do is I want to incorporate distances. And now what I do is I in order to do this, I want to, I'm looking at a new notion of expander. And now this is not exactly as in the paper because I'm ignoring log factors here. But now if I ignore log factors, what is an expander? If I ignore log factors, an expander is what is a normal expander. I already defined this, but if I not want, do not want to be so precise, I can say a normal expander is something where I can route any degree bounded demand with congestion roughly one over phi, ignoring pull up factors. So degree bounded demand is a vertex does not send or receive more than its degree. Or if I route between edges, and now I will switch to routing between edges, every edge sends and receives at most one. So this is a unit demand. Any unit demand can be routed with congestion roughly one over phi. This is equivalent to the definition that the graph is an expander up to, log, uh, up to log factor action. And now I kind of make the same definition for if I want to incorporate distances, I say, what is an edge hop phi expander? I say, now routing between edges, I say an edge hop phi expander is where any unit demand, every edge sends and receives at most one, the demand must be edge hop. So source and target edge should be at most edge hops apart. And every such demand can be out of congestion roughly one over phi along uh, a path of length roughly edge. 
So then I call something in H of X bar. Um, okay. So what is, uh, let's quickly ask what happens if I have a linear array. What is a linear array? <laughs> linear array is actually, so for us, we assume usually that H is small. H is a routing time for us. That is, is more or less the optimal routing time. Um, and if the optimal routing time is long, we can, our results are bad anyway. So we assume that the H is small. So actually a linear array is a one over H uh, is an H hop one over H expander. So um, this is actually um, this is actually pretty decent. So usually you want to have this expansion rather large, and if H is um, uh, if H is um, if H is maybe and a little of one, then that's a decent expansion. So why is this true? So where does this come from? Uh, because if I have a unit H of demand. What is the congestion of this demand? So how many paths should go through this edge? Only nodes at distance at most H want to use this edge if they want to connect to something here. So the total number of paths that can go through this edge can be at most order of H. And therefore the expansion of such a thing is rather good. So if I have something like um, maybe a small click here, a small click here, that is direct connected by an edge, then this has a very poor edge of expansion because all, everybody is close. So I can have a demand between all of this and every everything has to use this edge. So edge of expansion is poor here. Okay, so now, what is an H hop expander decomposition? What we do is we cut roughly phi m edges such that the remaining graph is an H hop phi expander. And we also, we want to do this also boundary. So this is maybe, this is kind of the, we transfer this definition of an expander decomposition to this H hop expansion case. And now the idea would be, we want to build such an expander hierarchy. Unfortunately, this does not work. So how can I, it's very difficult to build a hierarchy here. So the first thing is what we cannot do is, we cannot, um, the expander decomposition here does not partition the graph into pieces. So for example, if I have something like this, a click here connected by an edge, and then I have this long path. Oh. So I have this long path. <laughs> ah. Okay, so now this will not be an edge of expander because of these clicks. So the expansion will be very poor. But if I delete this single edge, then the expansion could be pretty decent because yeah, we said a long chain has a quite good edge of expansion. But now this, I can delete this edge. Now it's an edge of expander, but uh, now I cannot do a contraction or something like this because everything would contract into single vertex. So there's a problem here. Um, this, the, this way of building the hierarchy does not work. So therefore we kind of, we do, we do the routing differently. Um, so first, what we do is we introduce the concept of a subset expander decomposition. So now this is, so we are given a subset A of edges that wish to communicate. So not now not all edges wish to communicate. And we cut, roughly phi A edges. So previously we cut roughly phi M edges where by the 
A was all edges. And now the remaining graph, on the remaining graph, we should be able to route all H of unit demands that are supported just on the set of edges that have the demands and in addition on the cut edges. So this is kind of a subset expander decomposition. I kind of have this whole notion of this expander decomposition just to a set of edges A. And then I also want to have this boundary linked. I want to be able to support every unit demand on this set of edges where basically every cut edge comes in alpha parallel copies. So suppose that I have this expander decomposition. How do I do the routing? How do I build such an expander hierarchy? So I will not explain you how you actually get this expander decomposition and how to get this quickly because this is um, this is a very involved part of the paper, which maybe is too difficult to cover in a talk. Okay, so now suppose that we already uh, routed a little bit. So now the, currently the demand is just on a subset A of the edges. Maybe initially the subset is all edges. Every demand initially sets, sits at an edge. <laughs> and the demand is a chop. Now what we do is we compute an expander decomposition. This, a, this subset expander decomposition. So we compute a set of cut edges such that if I remove these cut edges, um, uh, sorry, such that I can now support every edge of demand on this set of edges. So every demand on this set of edges, where these cut edges even come with a lot of self loops, every unit demand on this set of edges, I can go out with small congestion. Now what I do is I, I will route demands in A that are close, even after deleting the cut edges. So initially we know that every demand in A is close. Every demand is a chop. Now, in G, uh, if I remove the cut edges, not all demand pairs may be close anymore. But now I re route all demand pairs that are still close. And okay, we have to do uh, think about how to do this. <laughs> Actually, the idea is as follows: How do I route the demand pairs that are close? You kind of, yeah, you cover everything with kind of small clusters clusters of small diameter. And now suppose that a demand is sitting here and its body, its partner is sitting here. Now I build such a cluster and inside this cluster, there are a few of these edges. All of these edges are closed. <laughs> so if doing this clustering, it happens that uh, your demand the, the source and the target of this demand, they are in the same cluster. Now what they will be actually doing, they will route both of them. This is important, we do routing from both sides. So this is S and this is T of the demand. Both of them, both sides will route to random edge, to random one of these edges inside this cluster. Okay, so this is not a random edge, but this is determined by hashing. You take, uh, take your ID, you um, concatenate, you, uh, add, uh, you concatenate the ID of your target. This is the ID, and based on this ID, you choose the target edge where you route to. So basically, what is happening? They route to this target edge, and if both are in the same cluster, they meet and they see, oh, I found my target, and then you can establish a path between. Them. And now you have to. Uh, this is a you do a small diameter decomposition in order to find these clusters. So. This is the first step. Everybody who is close, they route to the target. Uh, basically, all demands that are close, they can route. And now every demand that now still remains must be blocked by one, uh, by one of these cut edges. And now what you do is you route the remaining demand. So this is basically demands that doing this 
routing process didn't find their partner. They don't know where the partner is. They do this routing process. They didn't find their partner. So they conclude, oh, may, this means possibly that my partner is far away. Now, if you didn't find your partner, you route the demand to the cut edges. So if the demand is sitting here, you choose, and maybe your partner is sitting here, you and your partner, you will choose a, a cut edge that is not too far away, maybe to the closest cut edge, maybe this guy routes here, this guy routes, maybe not to the closest, but to one relatively close cut edge. So this goes here, this one goes here. And then in the next iteration, again, the demand is sitting at these edges. So the cut edges now will basically form the set of edges for the next iteration. And then in the next iteration, the edges where the demand is sitting has reduced by a lot. And then you are one level higher in the tree and um, uh, you can continue. And the thing is that uh, you have all these alpha copies here means that the congestion does not blow up too much. This is the same argument as in the, in the other congestion-based expander routing. Kind of the height is, uh, will be um, squared of log n. But uh, with every um, with every iteration, kind of the number of edges that are sitting at these cut edges only increase by log factor. Um, so the new set of cut edges will be roughly five times the set of original cut edges, and this gives so many levels. So now I want to, yeah. This is kind of the uh, the basic idea of this hierarchy. Now I just want to uh, finish with, yeah, I don't make the argument complete, but um, first of all, th there would be the question, why is there actually such an uh, age of expander? Why does there exist such, a, such an age of expander? Of course, in the paper, it's much more complicated to be actually constructed, but the existence argument, um, is not too difficult. <laughs> so how do you prove that something is an ordinary phi expand? There, what you can do is, what you have to prove is that you can route any permutation with congestion one over phi. And one way to prove that you can route any permutation with congestion one over phi is to do the following. Here's a, uh, we look at permutation with between edges, so we do edge routing. So Every edge injects one unit of flow and distributes this unit of flow equally to all other edges. This is a flow problem, one flow problem. If you can route this with small congestion, with congestion one over phi, then you can route any permutation with congestion one over phi. This is more or less, everybody routes itself uniformly everywhere else. And therefore you can, from this, you can build any permutation. This is kind of known as valence trick. Now, here, I do want to do something else. I want to show that any H-hop permutation I can route well. And for this, we it is sufficient to do the following. Um, and now this is also kind of maybe uh, on a subset, but I'm given a subset A of edges. I want to show that I can route any H-hop permutation on the subset. Now what I do is suppose that I can assign distance, I assign distances to the edges. So some distance distribution on the edges. And now if I give these distances, I have these distances on the edges, every edge assigns a weight to every other edge. The weight that I assign to an edge depends on the distance. So if the edge is H if the distance to the edge uh, uh, to the edge is h, then I give you a constant weight. If the distance, if you are log n times h away, I assign you distance of one over n or so, so nearly zero. So I assign a weight to every other edge, and then I 
every edge introduces one unit of flow and distributes it uniformly among the other edges proportional to the weight that you assign to the other edges. So this is this other routing that I just described for, for the expander, uh, for the ordinary expander, there the weights would actually be uniform everywhere. And now, if I have this weight distribution here, what does this mean? If I have two edges that are, that are distance h, they will assign the same weight to every other edge, roughly the same weight. They, the, the weights differ by a constant factor. But basically, if they send out one unit of flow, they will distribute it nearly in the same way. If I have two edges that are far away, they may distribute it completely differently. But because if you are close, you, you, you distribute your weight in the same way, one can show that actually any permutation where only close pairs want to communicate, they can use this exponential demand to actually exchange their traffic. So basically, maybe if you route from both sides, everybody routes to nearly the uh, same distribution. And from this, you can kind of exchange messages. So, um, if we can go out this exponential demand with congestion 105, then the graph is an H of phi x. And then, uh, okay, I don't go into the uh, into the proof now that you actually can uh, always find such a weighting so that this is an H of phi expander. But actually, yeah, informally what you do is there, if something is not an H of phi expander, you've, it means kind of you find a small cut somewhere. Uh, so sorry, if you if you cannot route this exponential demand, you find a small cut somewhere, then you will increase the length on the edges of this cut a little bit, and you continue. And we can show that this cannot go forever. So at some point you will find weights so that you can route this exponential demand. And then you have proved that there always exist such uh, um, exponential demand. And um, then uh, you uh, you can basically delete all edges that, that kind of where you, uh, you assign a very large weight to, and then we can show that this is an edge of uh, expanded decomposition. Okay, so, um, okay, this is the argument for this. Maybe we'll try to skip now. So what are the open questions? <laughs> One very important question is the de dependency, uh, dependency on age. Ideally, the running time, so, but this is only in the, um, um, in the constructive case. So the, the construction kind of is, depends polynomially on age. So ideally one would maybe have a, a running time that is linear in age. Um, the other big question is, can we obtain a polylog? And even this is even if I have an ordinary expander, I do not know how to obtain a polylog here in a distributed setting. And if you can do this, you can could solve quite a few problems in distributed computing. Okay, thank you very much. I'm open for questions. Okay, let's thank the speaker for an excellent talk and uh, we'll throw the floor open to questions now. I have one question. So you mentioned that uh, your result has implication for many problems in congest model, like MST yeah. and some other problems. So, mm -hmm. so, uh, so you, the other models in distributed computing, like local and others, does it have implications there as well or it's specific to congest? No, the, the thing is in the local model, uh, so here what we do is we do uh, packet routing and the important thing is here usually the congestion. This is a, if, if I only would care, care, for example, care about dilation, um, I, can, I can do the routing more efficiently. So in the local model, you don't really have a limit on congestion. You can send arbitrary amount of traffic along average. 
For example, if you have a lot of packets, you can, could send all the packets along an edge in one round. So there you don't really need to solve this. You can solve this packet routing problem uh, in a completely different way. You don't need the congestion at all, and therefore this is much easier. Let me ask another question then. So, mm -hmm. in general, in distributed computing, you assume the computation is, I mean, main bottomly is communication part. The computation is not important. You can do as much computation as possible. Yeah. But are there problems is where this really helps? I mean, the computation is actually not, I mean, you need really exponential type computation, et cetera, to speed up, or it is. Uh, I don't. I don't really know of important problems there. Usually the thing is at least, uh, at least if you want to do it really quickly, if you want to solve problems really quickly, meaning pull lock and many rounds. And another standard assumption, sometimes if you have con that you have constant degree. Then, then you can only have a data size of pull lock n. So you cannot collect uh, so many, uh, so much data anyway. And therefore very often then you, you, then this directly follows that you cannot exploit this really. But I don't know uh, of problems where you, where you could exploit this model. I would guess these exist, but they would okay. simply, yeah, be artificial, let's say, exploit this model. And does it have application in parallel algorithms, the, the, the expanded decomposition, for example, where, or even your idea of this alpha, uh, I forgot the name, like where you have multiple self loop and you can distribute things. Uh, does it have application in parallel computing where you can similarly distribute into some alpha number of different computers? Um, I am, so the thing is that, um, so there, this is used. Okay. If, if I kind of want to uh, use this for oblivious routing, uh, it's not so clear. So in parallel computing, the thing is, uh, so if I want to, um, decompose the computer network, then in parallel computing, usually the uh, network is quite regular. And the routing that I do there is, okay, you can do oblivious routing there, but you have much more information about your network and your ma network is very regular. So you don't need this machinery. Uh, sometimes there, what you get is you get the task of, um, you, you have the problems that you have, uh, yeah, maybe the communication structure of your problem. So maybe the graph is consists of processes that communicate with each other. And the edges of the graph are then the, communica uh, then the communication. And there, um, uh, if you, then this would not be a distributed setting, but there this scenario could help that basically you partition the graph into regions that are densely connected. And then you uh, you assign these regions to individual processes. So basically, this is kind of load balancing or assigning processes to uh, uh, to machines. There, stuff like this, uh, yeah, it simply is graph partitioning, and there uh, there fast algorithms for graph partitioning can be used. This is also this uh, soda paper that I mentioned there. Um, this also does this whole thing dynamic. So basically you can maintain this hierarchy even if um, edges are introduced and deleted. And therefore this will, would have some applications here. Last question. 
So if you have this oblivious routing question, but instead of having all nodes as a candidate for routing, maybe have some terminal nodes for source and uh, destination. And I only want to preserve, I mean, have some path strategy, which is restricted to only these terminals. I don't, I know only these are the source and destination. Others are intermediate vertices or hops. So, so mm -hmm. there, uh, is there something be better known or like, or something else we can do or it's, uh, or even vertex participation kind of techniques are they helpful those kind of places or um yeah so uh, you there are vertex pacification techniques um what you can do is you could vertex um Uh, you, yeah, you can do vertex pacification, and then you could do the oblivious routing on this on this vertex pacifier. Uh, I know that, uh, uh, but this is sometimes problematic. So, but yeah, I know that people looked at this this vertex pacification there. But here it will be more like flows pacifiers, and that is like we don't know much about them, or like what kind of pacification you need here. Um, yeah, this is a problem. Here you would need uh, uh, flow pacifiers. The problem is if you, um, of, of, okay, for routing, all of this is also if you just want to solve some cut problems in graphs. Um, there, this vertex pacification might be more relevant. The problem if you use this flow pacification. It's uh, it's kind of sometimes not so clear how to if you kind of make your graph smaller and you kind of have a flow there. How do you map the flow back in the original graph? You know that kind of the flow values are the same, but uh, doing it constructively is kind of uh, of difficult. Thank you. Okay, so do we have any other questions? Okay, then let's thank the speaker again and uh, thank you, Professor. Um, okay. Thank you for the for the invitation.